Hey everyone, um, in this video I'm going to be talking about uh, grid metrics, metrics of the transformation, inverse metrics of the transformation for, um, for CFD simulations. Uh, I'm going to apologize right now for all this stuff on here. I tried to squeeze everything in and even with all this stuff I didn't even, I put like a quarter of what I wanted to put down, uh, but I'm not adept at using any kind of video editing software just yet, so I can't put everything together, so I just decided to do it all in one take here. Um, okay, so, and I also have some notes uh, just to keep everything flowing a little bit smoothly for this. Um, <clears throat> so while it looks like a lot right now, this is really important if you want to do anything, uh, if you want to run any simulation that is not going to be run on a uniform grid, which is going to be a lot of things. Uh, so, for example, if you want to do the flow over an airfoil, you're going to have a, a grid uh, that's going to be wrapped around the airfoil. And when you have a grid that's wrapped around the airfoil like that, it's no longer just a uniform rectangular grid. Um, so you're going to need these things called uh, grid metrics in order to transform your grid from uh, the physical plane, which is when it's wrapped around the airfoil, uh, to the computational plane, which is a uniform rectangular grid. Um, so the reason, the reason that you want to uh, transform the grid uh, is because, so you want to transform the grid from this, any, uh, whatever type of, uh, whatever type of grid this is, and it doesn't have to be orthogonal either, um, and you want to transform it into this rectangular domain with a regular uniform mesh, um, and that's because you want to be able to use unweighted uh, differencing or one of the reasons is that you want to be able to use unweighted differencing schemes uh, for the governing equations. So what will end up happening is you, uh, I kind of put down these steps here, so one, two, three, four, five, um, so that will follow along. So don't skip ahead because it's probably looking a little confusing. Um, okay, so starting off we have, we want to transform the physical plane, or the physical domain into the computational domain. So physical domain is physically what is like wrap, what is wrapping around your airfo airfoil. Computational domain is where we're solving the equations. So the physical domain uh, is in, we have x, y coordinates. Uh, so we have x going this way, y going this way. Um, so for each i, j point, so you can see here that I have i's going along this direction, along the green direction, j coordinates going along the blue direction here. So for each i, j point, so for each point in this domain, there's a corresponding x and y, uh, an x corresponding x and y value. Okay, these, so when you transform it into the, into the computational plane, it's no longer going to be in terms of x and y, it's going to be in terms of z and eta. So they're, everything's kind of small, but I hope you can see, and I'm going to point stuff out when I'm going through it. Uh, so you're going to have things in terms of z and eta. So these lines here, this line here, this line here, this line here, these are constant z lines. Um, and then this line here, this line here, this line here, constant eta lines. Uh, so you can see that z, uh, z is, in the, is in the varying i direction, and then the etas are referenced in the varying j directions. Okay, so when we transform from the physical plane, which is in terms of x, y coordinates, we transform it into the computational domain, which is in terms of the z eta coordinates. So now you can see that we have... I didn't label this, but you can see that this, the green boundary corresponds to the green boundary here. The blue boundary corresponds to the blue boundary here. So since the green boundary was referenced from the eyes, that's why I have the eyes going in the green direction. On the blue boundary, we have the reference with J's, which is why I have the J's going in the blue direction. Um, so this is the Z direction. So these are lines of constant Z. So this line here corresponds to this line here. This middle line corresponds to this middle line. This right line corresponds to that right line, and then the same thing with the etas. These horizontal lines correspond to these lines uh, here. So in the computational domain, the spacing of the cells is uniform, so we have a uniform rectangular domain. That means that the spacing, the delta z here and the delta eta, they're always going to be one. That's just the way that it's defined. So you'll see these popping up in the finite difference equations for the inverse metrics, which I'll go over next. And those are, just remember that those are always one because that's just the way it's defined. Okay, so what you need to do, just as an overview, is um, 
what we're trying to find are the metrics of the transformation because those are going to be used when you um, when you transform your grid and when you transform the governing equations because the governing equations also need to change since you are transforming the grid into a different grid essentially. So we're looking for these grid metrics and they're in the form of a change in zeta with a, for change in x. So it's a d zeta dx, d zeta dy, d a to dx, d a to dy. So it's kind of how the grids are changing with respect to each other. Um, so that's the final goal. So what you really need to do first is calculate the inverse metrics. Okay, so we're transforming grids. And I'm sure you've done coordinate transformations from like spherical or cylindrical to Cartesian, and those had um, analytic uh, transformations. So I forget exactly, but like x is equal to r cosine theta or something like that for for cylindrical. Um, but you could calculate it based off of without having to do any numerical kinds of schemes. So the problem here is that this is a this is any old arbitrary uh, shape that you define, and these points, these points can be in any location in space. So, when you're trying to find out how they, how to transform them into the computational domain, we can't do it analytically, so we need to do it numerically, which is why you end up having to use finite difference approximations um, to get these inverse metrics first. And you'll see why we need the inverse metrics first before we can do the actual metrics. Okay, so that was step one is just an overview. Now we're going to go on to step two here, all in blue. Okay, so, so accepting the fact that we need to calculate the inverse metrics of the transformation first. Um, what are the inverse metrics? The inverse metrics are how x changes with zeta, um, and how x changes with eta, and then I also left out um, to save space how y changes with zeta, and how y changes with eta. So dx d zeta is going to be abbreviated as x sub zeta, or sorry, I'm using zetas, but it's really z, um, they just look like the zetas to me, so I just say zeta. But, um, okay, so dx dz is equal to x sub z, dx d eta is equal to x sub eta. Uh, in the same sense, dy dz is equal to y sub z, dy d eta is equal to y sub eta. Um, okay, now to calculate the metrics, we're going to use finite difference approximations. We'd like to have, or whenever I calculate the metrics, um, you'd like a higher accuracy because these are still approximations, so I'm going to use second-order accurate uh, finite difference approximations. Let me just say that this, is, this works, these, uh, what I'm doing right now is for finite difference, and I'll explain at the end why finite volume is different, um, or it's, it's a little bit different. So this is all for finite difference uh, equations or formulations right now. Okay, so for, we want to calculate the metrics at every single point in the domain. So when we're done with this, when we're done with all this calculation, we're going to have metrics, um, we're going to have metrics at every single point in this domain. And we're going to have four metrics, right? We're going to have uh, zx, Z, zy, a to x, a to y. So at every single point, we're going to have four metrics. Okay, so what we want to do then is calculate the inverse metrics at every single point. So what I'm going to do first is, since we want second order, second order accurate approximations, uh, you have to have different approximations for the boundaries um, than you do for the interior nodes because of which points you use and which points you physically don't have. So I'm going to do it first for the central node. So any node that's not on the boundary. So I'm kind of took this. We're doing it for this interior node here, and I'm going to be using these four points surrounding it uh, above and below. So that's what this is here. So we're just going to call this middle point I J. That means that the next point over in the x-direction, since the x-direction is the i-direction, is going to be i plus 1j. And then similarly in the negative uh, x-direction, since this is the i-direction, we're going to have i minus 1j. Okay. And then again, since we're in the computational domain, uh, the spacing between the grid points in the x or i-direction, well, in the z or i-direction, is delta z. Okay. So we're going to use a central, a second order central difference uh, to find um, the change in x with the change in uh, z. So that's going to be dx dz, which is the same as x sub z, which is equal to the change in x over the change in z. So that's equal to the x value at i plus 1j minus the x value at i minus 1j all over, and then since there's two delta z's here, it's going to all be all over two delta z, and that's second order accurate. 
And remember that delta z is actually 1, so the denominator is just going to be 2. Okay. Similarly, again, this is why I'm saying I only wrote down about a quarter of what I wanted to. Um, but similarly, if you have a, if you have dx d eta, you'll have x sub eta. It'll be delta x over delta eta, so the change in x will change in eta. And that's going to be, since we're in the eta direction now, we're going to be in the vertical direction. So we're going to have x of i j plus 1 minus x of i j minus 1 all over 2 uh, d eta. And d eta is equal to 1, so the denominator would also be 2 in this case. Okay, that's all well and good for the interior nodes because you have a plus node and a minus node uh, for every single interior node. What do you do with the boundaries, though? One of the possibilities, there's other possibilities, but one of the possibilities is that you can use a second-order accurate one-sided difference. For a second order accurate one side difference, you use three points. You use the boundary point, and then you use two points inside the boundary. So if I'm looking at this point right here, and I'm calculating in the z direction, I would have to use this point. So I have to use this point right here, and that's what I'm trying to find. And I have also have to use this point and this point. Um, okay, so an example of a boundary node, I'll... I'm going to do it for over here. So assuming that I'm looking at this node, I want the metric at this node, I have to use this node and this node. Okay, so an example of the one-sided difference, and you can find these differences, or you can create this difference using my stencil video, um, is, so we're going to find it again in the, in the z direction, or the i direction, for x sub z. So x sub z, uh, the second order difference is going to be negative 3, so x at ij plus 4x at i plus 1j minus x at i plus 2j all over 2 uh, delta z. And that's a second order accurate one sided difference. So that's going to be for the, for the left boundary or the bottom boundary um, where, the, where the i or j notation is 0 for the, for the side. If you're at the right boundary or the top boundary, in this case, you would have uh, what would happen is you would have these, these signs would all be switched. And instead of having, you'd have ij here, and then here you'd have. Instead of i plus 1j, it would be i minus 1j, and this will be, instead of i plus 2j, it will be i minus 2j, and still over 2 dz. Okay, so those are the inverse metrics. So now, after calculating all this, what we have is, at every single point in this, um, in this domain, in the computational domain, we have four inverse metrics of the transformation. We have xz, x eta, yz, y eta. And for the y's, you just use y's instead of the x's here. Okay. So now, what we're going to do is, um, okay, so, uh, okay, so now we have the metrics for the whole grid, and um, so what we need first to calculate, so we want to relate the, in, the metrics of the transformation to the inverse metrics of the transformation. So one of the things that we're going to need eventually is something called the Jacobian, which uh, physically for a 2D grid corresponds to... Um, the area of a computational cell, and in 3D it'll be the volume of the computational cell. I can make a video going over how to derive all this stuff from kind of vector calculus a little bit later, but it, it can get pretty complicated, so if you just take my word for it right now, that'd be great. Um, okay, so this G is the Jacobian, you usually see the Jacobian as J, but this is G here, um, the, the Jacobian of the inverse transformation. So remember how we have the metrics of the inverse transformation here? We need the Jacobian of the inverse transformation. So it's, you can, there's a lot of videos on Jacobians, um, so pretty much what we have is, it's how we relate the xy plane to the z eta plane, or computational domain. So the Jacobian here uh, is, so we take the derivative of x with respect to z, x with respect to eta, and that's here, xz, x eta, and then yz, y eta, and that's yz, y eta. We need to take the determinant of this, and the determinant is just, the diagonal is multiplied, so the xz times y eta, xz, y eta, minus uh, x eta, yz, x eta, yz. Okay, so you can see that the Jacobian of the inverse transformation is related to the metrics of the inverse trans transformation. So once you have these values here, you know, or you can calculate, at every single grid point, you can calculate the metrics of the inverse transformation. The Jacobian, or you can calculate the Jacobian of the inverse transformation. The Jacobian of the transformation... Uh, is denoted by J, and it's just the, so they're, they're related to the inverse transformation by the inverse, so uh, G is equal to the inverse of J, where J, in the same way that I did it here, uh, is, 
is going to be z sub x, z sub y, eta sub x, eta sub y. It's a little small, but, um, but we're going to be using uh, this one up here in section 4. Okay, so in section 4, now we're going to, to get the metrics of the transformation, we're going to start with some obvious relations. So obviously the uh, derivative of x with respect to x is equal to 1. These are partial derivatives because remember uh, x is a function of z and eta. Um, okay, so so dx dx is equal to 1, dx dy is equal to 0, dy dy is equal to 1, dy dx is equal to 0. Okay, so now if we expand each of these derivatives, so if I expand the dx dx in terms of the chain rule, um, and remembering that x is a function of z and eta, we get dx dz, and then this term here is z, z sub x, which is dz dx. So when you cancel out the dz's, you get dx dx. That's the first term here from the z term. Then we have plus dx d eta, and then this is d eta dx. Um, so this is just the chain rule. And then we set that equal to 1 because dx dx is equal to 1. Okay, now for the um, dy dx over here, uh, so we're going to use this one and this one. So dy dx is equal to 0. So expanding the dy dx term with the chain rule, we get dy dz dz dx plus dy dy eta dy eta dx is equal to 0. Okay. You can you also do that for these two here um, in the similar way that you expanded out in the chain rule here. So using we're just using this one and this one for these two equations. We can put these two equations in the matrix form. So the matrix form is so dx dx is just x sub x, dy dx is just y sub x. That's equal to this matrix. So we have the x sub z, that's the dx dz, x sub eta, that's dx d eta, y sub z is the y sub z, y sub eta is the dy d eta, and then that's multiplied by this array, z x, eta x, and that's equal to 1, 0. Okay, so we can solve this. So remember the goal is that we're trying to solve for the metrics of the transformation, which is z x and eta x for these two equations. When we use these two equations, you'll be solving for z eta, or sorry, z y eta y. So I'm just doing this for these two metrics. We use Kramer's rule, which says to solve, um, so we're, we're going we're gonna to replace uh, the first column with the solution here, replace that here, and that's the top part. So we're going to take the determinant of that, and then that's going to be divided by just this matrix here. Now if you recall from over here, this bottom matrix is just the Jacobian of the inverse transformation. So the bottom is just G. The top is 1 times Y eta minus 0 times X eta, so that's just Y eta. So we have Y eta over G. G is equal to inverse of J, so Y eta over G, inverse of J. And then we can just bring it to the top, so it's equal to J eta, or J Y sub eta. So that's just the metric of the transformation, that's one of the metrics of the transformation, is z, it's z sub x is equal to j y sub eta. You do this for four times, so you solve z x, then you solve eta x, then you solve, with these two equations, you solve uh, z y and eta y, and you end up with these four um, metrics of the transformation, and that's the end goal of this calculation. So z x is equal to j y sub eta, z y is equal to negative j x sub eta, eta x is equal to negative j y sub z, and eta y is equal to j x sub z. And those are the metrics of the transformation, um, which you use for the transformation from any curvilinear coordinate system to uh, your computational domain. And I hope that clears up some issues uh, with metrics, because I know there's not a lot of resources online uh, for calculating this or for figuring out where it comes from. So if you want, I can post a video of kind of the background of, of all this. I mean, there's a lot of math involved, but if you, if you want, I can go through the math. Um, and, and then I might also go through a video of how you can, because you need to transform the, the, the uh, governing equations. Um, since they're not the same, they're going to be transformed uh, with the metrics. I can, I can also go through how to do a simple transformation of the governing equations if you'd like. So uh, let me know. And uh, thank you for watching.